it's really quite clear that the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. And that's not just in Blade Runner and films like this. We're looking at an explosion of technology. Everything it can do, everything that used to be science fiction is becoming science fact. And many, many people think that this is going to be a dystopia and that climate change will basically evaporate our world and we're having a very negative view on the world and where things are going. Other people think it's going to be more utopia, like turning into a sort of a, a heaven, right? Which I think, I hope that's true, but I think there's a great potential for it. But generally speaking, it's quite clear that our main thing is about this, right? Exponential change. Technology is becoming mind-bogglingly fast and doubling in power every 18 months, right? So we're not going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're leaping, we're in the leap age, right? 4, 8, 16, 32, in 10 years we'll be at 256 if we're at 4 today. That's an assumption I think that's pretty fair. We're at the knee of the, of the exponential curve at the pivot point, right? So in 20 years, that's 1 million times as far as today. And clearly that's because technology is now absolutely everywhere. I call this the game changers. Like, for example, of course, uh, big data, cloud computing, the Internet of Things, quantum computing, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, um, the, uh, the blockchain, 3D printing, virtual reality, genomics, and the synthetic biology revolution, the possibility of creating new materials, nanomaterials. And this is all, like I said earlier, Science fiction, science fact, well, it's real now. People are, are actually printing houses in 3D, right? Printing them in, in, in Austin, Texas. I saw a great film about that the other day. In, in China, printing entire houses, printing kneecaps, printing dental implants, uh, printing things like, like earlobes uh, that are made from plastic materials. So technology is leaping, and we have to take a look at this. Well, that's going to be great, but also, we have to be sure where to safeguard humanity, right? How can we keep things like mystery, secrets, privacy, the things that make us human? You know, humans are not machines, so we don't want to be treated like a machine, right? And that is a real challenge in the age of technology, when things are potentially dehumanizing, like social networks, right? Facebook, Twitter, and others are at times more machine activity, artificial intelligence, uh, and robots, bots, right, than anything else, and manipulating us. So a very, very big topic, how we can keep that safe for our future. And uh, Kevin Kelly, who talks a lot about this, and uh, he talks about protopia, basically, the idea of saying that we're not going to have utopia, which is impossible, or dystopia, which is famous, you know, favorite Hollywood theme. But then we move into a future of protopia, right, a stepwise approach to a better future. So he says we should be optimistic. Uh, Kevin, of course, is the chief maverick at Wired Magazine. He's a great futurist for a long time, um, one of my mentors. And uh, we should be optimistic, he says, not because our problems are smaller, they are not, right? but because our capacity to solve them is larger. So we have a lot more tech to deal with climate change, to deal with agriculture to deal with healthcare, right? I'll give you a couple stats on this, right? So first take a look at this curve where, you know, we're moving into a future where all of these things are everywhere. Blockchain, genome sequencing, robotics, energy storage, and new industries are popping up. Five multi-trillion dollar innovation platforms. I think this is from ARK Invest here from last year. Right? The blockchain, energy storage, robotics again. Huge business opportunities, huge new ways of generating employment. We're moving into a future where healthcare is going to be based on analytics and data, not just on pills. The cost of megabyte per genome, megabase of genome sequencing is dropping to almost zero. I think it's $800 now to get that done. Climate change, we have great solutions here, right? I mean, they are everywhere. You know, we have alternative products, we have vertical farming, we have battery storage all in the next decade, right? That makes me extremely hopeful as we're moving into the future of technology, right? Digitization. Uh, and that is going to be a great benefit, for example, for pollution, for environmental control, for making smart cities, and, you know, everything is becoming smart and connected, right? Agriculture, food, maybe even politics, who knows? And I think the main challenge here is that technology is morally neutral until we use it, William Gibson. Right? We have to keep technology ethical. We have to make sure it does the right thing. 
And we have to make sure that it allows human flourishing and human expansion. It doesn't make us into slaves of technology, so technology becomes a religion, right? Or technology becomes the purpose of life, which of course would be ridiculous. So basically, we're looking at this, uh, this paranoia of, of understanding, okay, it could potentially be quite bad, you know, when technology turns from a present into a bomb. Uh, and that we have to prevent, especially with artificial intelligence. And uh, we have to have a global treaty on artificial general intelligence, and we have to understand how we can safeguard humanity against the externalities. As humans and machines are, well, I wouldn't say converging, but we're coming closer and closer. Our mobile phone, our, uh, our virtual reality helmet, right, our holograms, we're going to become a lot more connected with technology, HI, human intelligence and AI, so-called artificial intelligence. That's really quite a bit of a misnomer. These machines aren't intelligent in that sense, right? They're, they're powerful, but they're smart more than intelligent, right? And basic uh, uh, definition of AI is this. It's computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge, says Demis Sasabi, the CEO of DeepMind. Now, that's both scary, but also very accurate, really what these machines are doing, they're taking this raw flow of data and creating some sort of intelligence from it, some sort of smartness, I think that's probably better said, because they're still binary, right? Yes or no? You can see that when you see mistakes on Google Maps or in Gmail replies and things like that, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not anywhere close to human intelligence yet, but it will eventually get there, probably around 2050, my futurist colleague Ray Kurzweil says about what's called the singularity. So, as we're moving into this future, we have a clear indication already what's happening is that AI can make people work much smarter. We're looking at roughly 4x the productivity, as we see here for office and admin support, paralegals, and lawyers even, right? Not four, but about two, two times the amplification through AI. And then we're seeing, of course, uh, enterprise artificial technology helping with enterprises will explode in value, literally trillions of dollars. And what we have to think about that is, of course, to say, well, that's all very useful, but we should keep the human in the loop. Right? Make sure that we can control these technologies. Make sure that bias, for example, isn't everywhere and giving us wrong advice or making things look different than they are, distorting, manipulating the truth. I mean, one thing clearly that's happening is automation is going to be everywhere, just like it is in the factory now, in Amazon warehouses, you know, where the robots are picking the presents to be shipped and even wrapping them too, right? Putting them in a box all by themselves. Well, not entirely yet, but very soon. So, very important to realize here as technology is becoming that sort of huge suction moment where everything is about technology. The car industry, of course, the, the technology industry itself, but also uh, banking and you know, healthcare, all merging with technology. Media already has merged with technology. Uh, says uh, Christine Lagarde, the IMF head, says automation is good for uh, growth and industry, but bad for equality. And that is something we have to keep in mind. I think we're going to need an automation tax you know, to make sure that the benefits that automation gives to big companies like telecom companies and big organizations, robotic process automation, RPA, right? Uh, that this is being used also to give back to the workers, you know, to the average person. Um, and that's going to be quite a bit of political struggle around this idea. But clearly, you know, the temptation to automate everything will be there. And that may be a good thing when it's about really like dirty, dull and dangerous work like mining or so, right? But many other work, for example, in the supermarket, the checkout or so, we need to keep things human there as well. And sometimes it's better to actually have a human uh, to do different things that humans do that machines can do, like empathy or compassion or socializing, of course, those kind of things. 